Hi everyone, welcome to uh, our Q4 final APAC webinar for 2023. My name is Paul Miller, I'm a customer success manager in the region and uh, today our webinar is on accessibility in Canvas. Uh, hopefully you'll learn a lot from uh, what I'll be sharing with you today and um, <clears throat> Uh, maybe you'll come away thinking a little bit differently about accessibility and what it means and some things that you can do in your Canvas courses to help improve accessibility for your students in particular. So first of all, I just want to start off with a bit of a poll and just get a bit of a gauge of the types of people we have in the webinar today. Uh, if you can just select what type of organization you're from, just so we can have a bit of an idea of our audience. All right. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So I'll just end that there. Uh, and it looks like we've got a bit of a mix of people from all sorts of walks of life in relation to education today. So the one thing we all have in common is that we're all using Canvas, which is awesome. So everything that I'm going to share with you today uh, is applicable across all sectors. So no matter whether you're in K-12 or vocational education, higher education, corporate education, or any other further education, uh, all the things that I'm going to be talking about today are applicable. Um, so I have a, another poll. And the question is, do you currently think about accessibility when you create your Canvas courses? Well, it's very, very interesting as the results are coming through, just to see a bit of a mix there. Okay, I think that's pretty good. I'll share those results. And I'm glad that quite a few of you do think about accessibility. Um, that's, that's really, really awesome. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to give you a couple of pointers on some extra things you might wanna consider, but there are some people who sometimes Think about accessibility and uh, some of you who are not quite thinking about it at this stage. But that's great. So let's, let's dive into what it actually is. What is accessibility? And there's a really good description by, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> by Martin Legro, who uh, says information and communication technology is considered accessible if it can be used as effectively by people with disabilities as it can by those without. So comparable access to information must be provided, taking the needs of all users and learners into account. True accessibility provides for not just the sightless and hearing impaired, but also for the colorblind those prone to seizures and people with physical limitations that require keyboard navigation rather than the use of a mouse. Now, I'm actually gonna be talking about uh, ideas and thoughts on accessibility that extend beyond what Martin has said there on the screen as I go through the presentation today. So keep an open mind as to what accessibility means beyond what is on the screen just there. But sometimes people get a little bit confused between accessibility and accommodation. Now, accessibility is, and catering for accessibility is, uh, it's the responsibility of everyone who creates course content, uh, whether it's Canvas or any other learning management system that's online or any system online, I should say. So any website uh, or any software as a service, and it provides, uh, in the case of learning management system, is provided for all students with no expectation of an explanation of need. So it's expected for disabilities that are easily anticipated. Now, accommodation is where you're providing for very specific needs of a student with a, a documented disability. Uh, I know in New South Wales, where I live, 
Uh, there have been reports in the past about people who have had accommodations for their high school certificate exams um, due to all sorts of things, um, uh, things that, that are sometimes visible and things that aren't visible to other people. Um, I'm going to be talking about that in a second as well. But, uh, you know, accommodations are where you actually have to provide specific accommodations for the specific needs of a specific student. Uh, whereas accessibility, it, it doesn't matter who the student is, you're catering to everyone. Um, but, uh, you know, accommodations might be things like providing an interpreter for sign language uh, for uh, people who have hearing impairments or um, having lecture transcripts for live courses. Um, and, you know, these circumstances for accommodations are usually uh, difficult to anticipate and prepare for. And there's usually uh, an office at of the organisation that helps students with accommodations, whereas accessibility, as you'll see as we go through today, uh, it, it caters to everyone, no matter if you have uh, a disability or not. And sometimes, as I said, sometimes those are visible and sometimes they're not. So, you know, a really obvious uh, disability is, say, someone in a wheelchair. You know, my uh, mother is in a wheelchair and it's quite obvious, um, you know, when she pulls up into a disabled parking spot that, that is the case, that uh, she has a, a physical disability. Or they might carry a walking cane or they might be using sign language. And it's, it's quite visible to, that you can see that that person has a, a disability. And so we can cater to those, uh, those um, individuals to make things more accessible for them. Um, but there are often invisible disabilities that people don't necessarily see. So someone might be having some uh, mental health uh, issues that they're working through. They might have anxiety or depression, or they might have chronic pain uh, or sleep disorders. Uh, you know, people might have sleep apnea, which affects their concentration and ability to work in a focused manner. And so these things are sometimes not very obvious and we can help to cater what we do uh, as course designers in particular to cater to both visible and invisible uh, disabilities. Now, why on earth do we need to do this? Well, first of all, it's the right thing to do. Uh, hopefully that's obvious to everyone. But uh, there are actual um, laws in place to provide for people with disabilities. And you know, it's incumbent on us to be able to make make sure that we can do that for those people. And the big one in Australia, in any case, is the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992. And that's a Commonwealth Act, uh, which outlines uh, you know, laws in relation to disability. Now, back in the day, I used to teach uh, web design and a, a famous case that was, uh, that came to bear right before the Sydney Olympics, which is a massive event in Sydney and a massive sporting event for Australia, as you can imagine, it's the Olympics. Uh, there was a case um, brought against the uh, Sydney Olympic Committee organisation. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Sydney Olympic Committee uh, for the Olympic Games. And the, the abbreviation is, is SOCOG. Uh, and essentially, the website that SOCOG had created for the Sydney Olympic Games was not accessible. They uh, did not have items in place to make it easy for people with visual impairments in particular to be able to uh, navigate the site. Now, Mr. Maguire, who uh, filed the suit against SOCOG, um, he used a, a, a Braille machine to read the information on websites. And one of the things that SOCOG didn't do, which I'll get into uh, in one of the future slides I'm gonna go through is uh, alt text on their website. So it's alt text is a way of describing an image so that when it's read out by uh, you know, a braille machine or whether it might be in an audio fashion using uh, other tools, you, 
you could actually understand what that image is and not just get a file name or something that's not easy to interpret. Uh, there were a couple of other things that they didn't do. Uh, they didn't make it easy to navigate the website uh, and they lost, SoCog lost. And Mr. McGuire was ordered damages um, for uh, in, in this case. Now, there is a body called the W3C and they have um, the WCAG uh, rules for developing uh, accessible content uh, on web pages. And Canvas itself has is compliant with the, the, WK, the latest WCAG uh, guidance, and uh, we, we try to keep it that way. But you, as a course designer, uh, you need to make sure that you do things within the content you add into Canvas uh, to make sure that it is accessible. Now, as you can see, I've actually got some links here on the slides that I'm sharing, and we will post the recording of this webinar up on the Canvas community. And uh, these, these links will be accessible. I'll, I'll post uh, the slides as well, so you can have a copy of this uh, to follow up if you so desire. But when we think about accessibility, it's more than just adding in uh, items on your um, on your Canvas course to make it accessible with people with a specific disability. Now, one thing that people often don't consider is accessibility when it comes to learning means also making content accessible for students outside of the classroom. So the, the definition actually, it gets expanded upon when you include it for learning. Now, we've gone back to, face-to-face -face classrooms across the world uh, after COVID and lots of lockdowns all over the place. But this is not an excuse to no longer be using a learning management system. In fact, uh, it was an opportunity for the world to realize that, hey, we have these tools which are really, really useful to help students who can't make it into the classroom and also for students who are in the classroom. Now, uh, providing access to your course materials inside the learning management system for people who are there face-to-face -face and those who aren't able to make it face-to-face -face provides equity of access. And that's really, really important. There's a lot of really good reasons why people can't necessarily make it into the classroom. And this could be illness or injury. It could be uh, hospitalization. Um, they could be a way for sporting events. Speaking of Olympics, they, we could have some people who are off to the Olympics and so can't actually attend face-to-face, -face, uh, people who are actually studying, um, professional um, sports people. Uh, but there's also for, for distance and remote education. So being able to provide that access, and we have a number of examples across the region where people are providing that equitable access to students whether they're in the classroom or not. So students have access to the same materials. They have access to be able to submit their assessments. They have access to be able to do what they need to do because the course has been designed to give them all of that information and the access to submit their assignments uh, no matter where they are in the world. Now, there is a framework that uh, well, it's used quite across the world and we tend to, with any templates that are created or any courses that our company creates, we follow this framework. It's called Universal Design for Learning. And this is a framework for being considerate about how you design your courses so that you have uh, lots of different ways to engage students and to accommodate all sorts of styles of learners. Um, as I said, you can access this presentation after the webinar, I will put it on, on the website and you can find out more information about UDL. That link there uh, works to go through to their website for their guidelines. But UDL provides for multiple means of engagement. And I'll give some examples of this as we go through uh, today. So this is the why of learning. Also multiple means of representation, uh, which is the what of learning. Uh, and how that's, that's represented within your course. And then action expression. So um, this is the how of learning. So 
there we go. Thank you very much, Rio, for putting that in the chat. Um, one thing that we, a bit of feedback, which UDL leans heavily in towards is consistent course structure. Now, it's important that you structure your Canvas courses from course to course so that they are consistent in layout and general approach to uh, navigation throughout the course. So this reduces the cognitive load for your students and it makes learning more effective. Uh, it also encourages that collaboration between departments within an organization, because if you're, you've got that basic structure is similar, you can relate to each other, even though your content might be slightly different, you can have that, make it easy so that students know where to go in each of their courses to be able to access their materials, where they go to submit their assignments and keep it nice and consistent. They, they don't have to think quite so, so, so much about that. We did notice, uh, particularly at the beginning of COVID, that there are a lot of organisations that came on really quickly uh, to Canvas and um, for ones that uh, did not have a consistent approach, it was still a, a bit of a, an uphill battle initially, but most people realised rather quickly that having that consistency made it much, much easier for students uh, studying to be able to figure out what they needed to do within their courses. Now, I briefly mentioned navigation. Now, simplifying your navigation makes it much, much easier and, again, reduces that cognitive load for students. And it's very easy to hide unnecessary navigation items within Canvas itself. Um, so when you do that, it's important to put it in a logical order. Of course, having home up the top makes a lot of sense. Um, we, uh, if you use modules, having that right near the top as well. You might also have your uh, grades or marks for the students for them to be able to quickly access that as another option on your navigation. But again, try and keep that consistent between courses. And there are tools that you can use inside of Canvas to help with that. You, know, you can use blueprints and you can sync the settings of courses from the blueprints to other courses. You can even use course templates inside of Canvas. And when you, whenever you create uh, a new course in uh, an account in Canvas that has a course template applied, it will apply the, the structure and the settings of that template course to that new course. So there's lots of really to cool tools that you can utilize for that. Another way to stay consistent is a feature in Canvas that a lot of people think is very much catered towards junior schools or primary schools, and that's Canvas for elementary. Now, this actually provides for a consistent navigation up the top here, where you have a homeroom and you can see the schedule of the things and tasks that you have upcoming, important dates that you can mark, your actual grades or marks and resources uh, in your homeroom course. And then that links off to your individual courses and the navigation stays consistent in those individual courses as well. So you've got your home, uh, your schedule, your modules, your grades and resources in those courses. So you're not cluttering up the course and you're creating an environment that's a little bit more decluttered for your students to make it easier for them to navigate within Canvas itself. Now, as you can see, the font that's currently on these screenshots is our junior font. And that font is used for legibility to mimic the, the writing styles that we teach in junior schools. However, you can select to use the standard Canvas font. And we actually have organizations that are not junior schools who've turned on Canvas for elementary. And this has cleaned up their dashboard. Uh, it now becomes your homeroom. You can create a homeroom course for your students and makes this navigation within the courses much more streamlined and simplified. And you've got that standard Canvas font. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's not just limited to the junior schools uh, across the world. Now, one of the items I mentioned there was modules. Modules are a really effective tool for helping your courses to be more accessible to lots of different learning types and to make it a little bit more um, logical in the presentation of your data. Think of it as your scope and sequence for your content in your Canvas course. And it also gives the opportunity for you to chunk that content. Now, chunking content is really important because it makes it more manageable for students to be able to go through that content 
makes it easy to repeat that content, um, to go over and over it again and again, to be able to pause and go back and easier to understand. Uh, again, it's that it can, you can get that cognitive overload if you've got the scroll of death as we call it, where you have a whole heap of content all on one page and the student has to keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling to get through it. So use those modules to chunk up your content to make it easier for that navigation. Um, there's also requirements and prerequisites. Again, this makes it really obvious for students who are going through a Canvas course to know what to do. Um, and Requirements are things like you know, viewing a page, uh, scoring at least a certain amount uh, in a particular assessment or marking a particular item as done in your module. Now you can set those requirements and a student can actually see their progress as they step through each of those requirements and see where they're up to. And the instructor can view uh, the progress of the students going through those modules to see where they're up to. Um, and you know, that makes it much easier to see if students are falling behind and you maybe need to give them a little bit of extra assistance as well. Um, we also have prerequisites. So if you uh, are sequencing your modules so that your course content, content follows a logical order, you can make it so that the previous module is a prerequisite for the next one and so on and so forth. Um, and that, that makes it uh, a little bit easier for your students as well because they're not jumping the gun to content that they're not quite ready for if you do need to sequence the content in that way. Iconography can help immensely with accessibility for every single type of learner. So I, I noticed the chat is pretty quiet uh, feel free to jump in there and say what you think each of these icons represents if you had that in a Canvas course. Just jump in the chat and anything you think that, that might be representative. Yep, home, home page, home, 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 read, yes. Info, take notes, yep. That's a really good question from Kat, Catherine there. If our school has its own icons, can we add them into Canvas? Yeah, you certainly can. In fact, uh, we actually, uh, a cool thing that you can do is add them into Commons and then people can actually mark them as their favorites in Commons and easily access, access them from the rich content editor to add it on, onto their pages really easily. Um, but think of these icons as signposts. You know, they're, they're there to guide the learner as to what they're meant to be doing at that point in time. So yes, they might need to be reading um, or this is just information that they need to be, uh, that's important that they need to look through. Um, or this is an assessment task that they need to submit. Um, Jahan K, yes, Canvas icons. If you use alt text, they can be read by screen readers. Uh, I'm actually, you jumped the gun on something I'm about to talk about, but uh, they can just be decorative as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. But yeah, use, use icons as signposts along the learning journey to help students know where they're up to and what they're meant to be doing at any point in time. Now, people who have known me for a while know that because I used to teach web design, um, I'm not a fan of using tables for page layouts, but there's a very, very, very good reason from an accessibility standpoint uh, as to why you should not uh, use tables for page layouts in Canvas. And that is they are not accessible <laughs> from a, a layout perspective. You know, tables are actually fantastic for tabular data, but they it, it's really, really difficult for someone using a screen reader to be able to go through the table to find where they are on the page, it's, it's not accessible at all. Um, if you do need to use tables, <laughs> sorry, I'll just circle back. Um, tables were used when websites were created in the 1990s because that was the only tool that they had at the time uh, in HTML to be able to lay out things on the page. But uh, things have changed since the early 2000s on that front. So 
we have other elements that you can use on the page, but really, really importantly, it's the sequencing of your content on the page that is more important than having a specific image in a specific spot on the page. One thing to consider on that front is people use different devices to access content in Canvas. And depending on the device that they use, that content will shift around anyway. So someone on a mobile device is not going to see the content in exactly the same way as someone who's on a widescreen monitor on a desktop computer. Uh, so yeah, make sure that you care more about your sequencing of your content, the order of your content. And that way, if someone goes from a big widescreen to a smaller mobile device, it just collapses down underneath each other and uh, it makes it a lot easier for everyone, no matter the device they're using. Um, a good point there that I've, I've put on the list is, you know, tables are not responsive by default. Um, you know, you should use percentages and add percentages to your table so that they become more responsive for mobile devices. Uh, but only use tables for tabular data. All right. So you may not think this is something that makes your course more accessible, but adding a, um, an image to your course cards for student dashboards is really, really helpful. It makes it quick and easy to, for your students to be able to find your particular course if they have multiple courses on their dashboard, rather than having to literally read every single course title. Uh, it's really easy for them to recognize that imagery for the course. Uh, so if you use an appropriate image, then uh, yeah, it just simplifies them finding where they need to go when they've got multiple courses on, on their dashboards. Now, there's a lot of great information in relation to accessibility and things that you might want to include in your courses on a resource that we have in the community called the Course Evaluation Checklist. And I might get someone from our team to just put a, a link to that uh, from the community page uh, into the chat so you can access it. But it's a really fantastic resource that you can use to create your own minimum requirements for your organization. You don't have to replicate it exactly. And your minimum requirements might be slightly different to uh, another organization's minimum requirements. But if you spell that out for your course designers and instructors and give them the appropriate uh, support and professional development to help them to know what they need to do, it can be a really powerful resource to create a similar uh, resource in your organization. Uh, uh, so Khan will ask a question just before I go on to the next one. Can we map one blueprint with multiple copies of Canvas course? So one subject, multiple lectures teaching that subject. Yes, that's exactly how blueprints work. Um, so you can connect one blueprint course. There are no students in a blueprint course. It's purely for creating content. And you can connect that to multiple other Canvas courses to distribute that content, to push that content out to those connected courses. All right. Alt text, I did mention this in relation to the SOCOG case earlier on, but alt text is descriptive test text that describes the image on the screen and helps people using screen readers in particular. Uh, and, but you can actually have decorative courses um, and flag, uh, sorry, decorative images and flag those images as purely decorative. You know, they're, they're, it's not actual course content. You may want to create a, or flag a, an icon as decorative, for example, um, or you may not. That question was asked earlier. You may want to put alt text there so that it helps with navigation. Um, but you may have other forms of navigation on the page uh, for people with screen readers in particular. Um, one of those I'm going to talk about in a second is headings on your page. Um, but if you don't have that alt text, all you, all you see on the screen reader is just the readout of the file name. And that's not really helpful, particularly if it's a really ambiguous file name. Um, and you know, the, the user may not have, it may not, the file name may not be fully descriptive of what is actually on the image. So make sure you do add the alt text to your images in Canvas, which is pretty easy when it's right there when you add the image in. Uh, there are some great resources you can use for accessing royalty-free images. 
and you know for photography there's pixabay unsplash and pixels um but also for icons and banners flat icon and icons 8 i've used icons 8 quite a lot um but canva for education is also an awesome resource for creating banners and your own icons there's you can do all sorts of stuff in there uh, and as we mentioned earlier, you can bring your own icons into Canvas, no problem, and just add them into your course files and use them again and again. Now, I briefly mentioned headings, uh, but also I've bundled that together with lists. So headings are a logical way of creating your content, and hopefully we're all doing this, but sometimes people use headings incorrectly. Sometimes they use the heading function to just change the size of uh, their text on the page, and that's not an appropriate use of headings. Headings provides that structure. Think of like a, a contents page where you've got the, the headings, subheadings, and sub-subheadings. So what you don't want to do with headings is go from a heading one straight to a heading three because that makes no logical sense. You've got to go heading one, heading two, then heading three uh, because heading three is under heading two. Um, so, but you also want to make sure that you use, when it's appropriate to use lists on a page, make sure you use them. Don't just put dashes or icons unless the icon is inside the list. Uh, make sure you actually use bulleted lists and numbered lists for sequential items because that's really helpful for someone using a screen reader to understand the content on the page. Now, I did mention file naming conventions. There are some terrible file naming conventions that we see sometimes. And it's really important to make sure that you give descriptive file names when you do name your files and upload them into Canvas. That can be really helpful, if, particularly if you're just adding in files as resources in your module or on the page in Canvas. Um, and if a student maybe is even downloading a file, it, if it's descriptive, that will help them to be able to find it later on on their device. Uh, so make sure you use decent file naming conventions. I love this little cartoon here because I have seen almost that exact thing on someone's computer before. <laughs> so I saw that and I thought I'd add that because it's a classic and it is true, it does happen. Um, one thing to be really mindful of is colors. Now, color blindness is actually very common. So if you're referring to things by color, just be mindful that people who have color blindness may not be able to see what you're referring to, may not be able to interpret the data on the page or uh, you know, make sense of what you're trying to convey in your content. So just be mindful when you do use colors that you're not reliant on the color itself to convey information on the page. Now, for example, in this one, if someone was colorblind and um, I said, how many uh, red uh, slats are on this abacus? Uh, sorry, how many, uh, what are they called? Like little baubles, I guess, are on this abacus? Then they would have difficulty answering, answering that question. But readability on the page really makes a big difference depending on the colors that you choose. So you can see in the top one, by default, Canvas has a white background and it has a dark complementary color, which increases the readability of the text on the page. Um, but also the reverse is true. So if you've got a dark background with a light colored font or light colored text, that can reduce eye strain. And that's more like having a, a dark mode or you know, night mode on your phone. Um, but if you've got a light text on the light background, I don't know if you can read that really well, but it's really difficult because the contrast is so low. It's really difficult to read that third uh, point there. Um, and that last one, certain color combinations are really difficult to read, you know, particularly the, the red on green or green on brown or uh, blue on purple. Like trying to, to distinguish those colors makes it really hard. Uh, okay. So I'm just gonna stop there. Mitchell asked a question in the Q and A. So feel free to ask questions in the Q and A uh, if you'd like as well. 
so if we use H1 in the RCE, how does this affect the screen reader when you'd think that would be the main heading for the page? Actually, the page title is an H1, uh, just for your information. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that is actually the, the H1 on the page. I, actually, I can't remember off the top of my head if you can select H1 uh, in the rich content editor or not. But uh, the, the title of the page is actually an H1 uh, when you create a page in Canvas. There you go. Thanks, Daniela. It is H2. That's what I thought. So the H1 is the title of the page. Um, all right. So, and, oh, there's a question in relation to dark mode. Dark mode is available in the Canvas apps. So it's not on by default for the content inside of Canvas, but um, you can actually select it within the mobile applications. All right. So I'm playing a video here. Uh, can anyone tell me what's going on in this video? Just jump in the chat. Have a guess. It is a balance exercise. I did actually say it at the very beginning. <laughs> but what is the lady in the, in the, um, on the right, what is she saying to the lady who's doing the walking? She's not facing the camera, so you can't really see her lips. You can't even do lip reading if you're good at that. But you have no idea what is going on if you had no audio like we had just then. Um, and so video captions are really, really useful. Uh, make sure that you use captions wherever possible if you include videos in your Canvas course content. Uh, it's useful for, for lots of different reasons. People may not be able to play audio at a particular time that they're viewing that content, even if they don't have any hearing impairment. Uh, so it, it could be helpful for lots of different reasons. Uh, Canvas Studio has auto captions. So you, if you create your own videos, you can up and you have Canvas Studio, then uh, it can auto caption. And there's also premium caption options for um, people who uh, have a particular provider. You can have that as well. Uh, you can also edit captions uh, in Canvas Studio. But one thing to consider if your organization has access to it, you might want to consider transcription services for any content that you're creating or just create a, a transcription of your script if you did script something uh, to put onto a video. That way people have access in multiple modes uh, to be able to look at the content and review what you're trying to get across at that particular point in your course. Uh, hyperlinks. So quite common, you see people with click here links. This is not awesome for accessibility uh, and for, for screen readers. You can see in this example here uh, that it, when you add a link, that link should be descriptive. The, it's, the descriptor is what you're linking and not an extra click here uh, because it it's, can be a bit ambiguous just having click here. So make sure you do have descriptive text when you create links uh, in your Canvas course. Now, there is a rich content editor accessibility checker built right into Canvas. And it's a fantastic tool because you just click on this little icon um, down underneath the, the RCE and it brings up all the issues that you currently have inside of your page or whatever you're editing in the RCE at that time. Not only does it tell you the issues, it tells you how you can fix them and it gives you the capability to fix it right there and then uh, within the accessibility checker. So it's a fantastic tool for uh, checking accessibility on your page. It'll check for contrast uh, of colors on your page uh, and it'll check for alternative text. It'll check for um, items in tables. If you Have you got a header row in your table? Uh, all sorts of great stuff. But there are other tools to help with accessibility that are built into Canvas. And one of those is the Microsoft Immersive Reader. 
this is obviously a Microsoft tool, but we've incorporated it into lots of different places inside of Canvas. It's not quite everywhere, but uh, it is in things like, uh, you know, pages and assignments and things like that, where students can have the, the text on the page read aloud. Uh, and uh, also you can have the, the, the text increase in size, as you can see on the, the screenshot there, so that it's more easy to read. Um, but there are lots of other tools and um, uh, in, in relation to accessibility that you can access. Uh, so one of our partners, City Labs, has a tool, there's a, a, an open source tool called You Do It uh, that anyone can download and they can uh, add in and uh, if they have the skills to be able to do so, they can add it in uh, to Canvas. But uh, the City Labs tool goes beyond what the open source tool does and helps you to transcribe things from videos and all sorts of fantastic stuff. Um, Ali is a, uh, another accessibility checker tool that you can install. It's an LTI tool that you can add into your Canvas instance. But there are also free tools uh, like the Google Screen Reader Chrome extension. Uh, so if you use Chrome, which uh, from our statistics, the majority of people using Canvas use Chrome, there is an extension you can add to Chrome for desktop for, uh, for a screen reader. But there are industry standard screen readers that people use um, like JAWS. JAWS is probably the most common one by far that we see people use at, for screen readers. And so you might offer links to these screen readers for your students so that they can download them and use them on their, on their devices. Uh, so JAWS is a Windows uh, screen reader. VoiceOver for Mac uh, is uh, available for Macs. NVDA is another screen reader. Um, and I did want to do a shout out. There's a really fantastic resource from uh, the University of Sydney that I've linked to there, uh, where they've got all sorts of great videos and information on designing for accessibility in Canvas. Um, so University of Sydney has been using Canvas for a number of years now, and uh, the guide is, is really excellent. So Rio has helpfully added links there uh, to uh, the things that I've just talked about. But uh, there are lots of other tools that I haven't added on here and lots of other items that you can do uh, that are probably beyond the scope of uh, what we're covering in this webinar. But um, that's they're the main points we wanted to cover off today. Thank you so much for attending the webinar today. And before we finish up, I just wanted to check if there were any questions anyone had that we hadn't covered yet or any other items that um, you'd want to talk about, feel free to add it into the Q&A or into the chat. And uh, if not, we'll finish up. Thanks, Daniela. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Nikki. All right, looks like we're, we're all good. As I said, we're going to upload this onto the Canvas community. Uh, we'll send that out in our newsletter as well, which is the newsletter you would have received to sign up for this webinar. Uh, that'll be in our next one, just a copy of the recording and the slides and everything, well, the link to the community page where we'll have the recording and the slides. And uh, if there's anything else, feel free to reach out to the CSN team. Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, see you on the next one. Thanks, everyone.